Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on where you're logging in from. Welcome to our annual Maxwell Lecture 2023 edition. For the people who are connecting from all over the world, thank you for joining us. My name is Ban Jun Yen. I'm the Chief Executive of Maxwell Chambers. It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Ms. Claudia Solomon, the President of the ICC International Court of Arbitration, who will be delivering this year's Maxwell Lecture. Claudia is widely recognized as one of the leading arbitration practitioners of her generation with more than 25 years experience representing parties in some of the most complex, high value and significant disputes. She brings vast experience to the court, driving a client-centric mindset. Claudia, it's an honor to have you join us from Paris today. We are very much looking forward to your lecture this afternoon entitled Awards and Rewards, Back to the Future. Without further ado, I will now hand the time over to Claudia. Thank you so very, very much. I'm really uh, thrilled to join all of you and really so appreciate the honor to give this year's Maxwell Lecture. This year is indeed the centenary of the ICC International Court of Arbitration. And to celebrate 100 years of the ICC court, we have had brigadeiros in Brazil, cookies in Seoul, cupcakes in San Francisco. Next slide. We've had cake in Houston, more cake in Lagos. And next slide. And eating all of those sweets around the world, we have also gone bike riding together. So what exactly are we celebrating? For 100 years since the ICC court was founded in 1923, we have been at the forefront of supporting global trade and investment through our pioneering dispute prevention and dispute resolution services. The ICC court is the only arbitral institution that is truly international, not linked to any one geography or subject to shifting political winds. And the ICC court has a unique role of scrutinizing draft awards and managing cases through its secretariat. So as we celebrate a centenary of service, we are taking this time to reflect on our journey and key milestones. And we are recommitting to our purpose to promote access to justice and the rule of law and shape the future of dispute resolution for generations to come. So today, and if you can just go back please, today I wanna to talk to you about the characteristics of arbitral awards in the early days of the court and the most common issues which you, we are now seeing during the court scrutiny of awards. Then I wanna share my thoughts about how arbitration may be conducted and how arbitral awards may be drafted in the future. And then I really hope to hear your thoughts during the Q&A session. So before we start talking about arbitral awards uh, in the early days of the court, let me take a step back to the founding of the International Chamber of Commerce and the founding of the ICC court 100 years ago. In the wake of World War I, a group of entrepreneurs who called themselves the merchants of peace sought to promote peace and prosperity through cross-border trade. Their initial motto was world peace through world trade. In 1919, 4,000 business leaders from Great Britain, France, Belgium, Italy, and the United States met for a multi-day conference in Atlantic City, New Jersey. It may be hard to believe now, but 100 years ago, Atlantic City was known for its resorts and boardwalks, and it was booming. Even my grandparents had their honeymoon in Atlantic City. Now, one of the attendees described this conference as the most important trade meeting in history. And it was a corollary to the Peace Conference at Versailles. Now on this slide, you can see a picture of the meeting, that first meeting of the ICC, in which the conference delegates launched the process that led to the adoption of the ICC's foundation and the first meeting of the ICC taking place at the Sorbonne in Paris. The resolution of disputes certainly was not the primary purpose of the ICC, but the founders 
understood that if they were going to promote peace and prosperity, if they were going to promote cross-border trade, they needed a system to resolve cross-border disputes. And from the outset, setting up a center for international commercial activity was a priority. In May 1922, the executive board of the ICC approved a plan to create, quote, an international court for hearing commercial disputes between nationals of various countries. And on the 19th of January, 1923, the ICC court was inaugurated. For the first meeting of the ICC court, more than 500 government officials and business leaders met at the Tribunal de Commerce de la Seine, known today as the Paris Commercial Court, right in the heart of Paris. Now you may be wondering, why Paris? Why is the ICC's headquarters in Paris? Well, it is a beautiful city, but a hundred years ago, it wasn't so obvious that Paris would be the headquarters. In a wonderful book entitled Three Ages of International Commercial Arbitration, Mikhail Shenazi writes that the initial documents setting up the ICC court describe the selection of the city for the headquarters to be, quote, determined. Atlantic City was even considered because the delegates were having so much fun at the beach. But ultimately, Paris was selected, perhaps as a compromise between the Americans who wanted a new organization to be close to Geneva, the French who suggested Washington, and the English who had suggested Brussels or Paris. Uh, next slide. Shinazi writes that the selection of Paris as the ICC's headquarters could also have been a gesture to Etienne Clementot, who was a national figure in France and served as the first president of the ICC and the first president of the ICC court. Clementot was an art patron and an artist himself. And just to provide you with a bit of human interest for the art historians out there, the next time you come to the ICC's headquarters, look in the lobby for the sculpture of Clemental made by his good friend, no other than Auguste Rodin. And the next slide, please. Now, when we launched the centenary celebration on the 19th of January this year, Alex Bessas and Jiva Filipic, the Secretary General and Acting Deputy Secretary General of the ICC Court, recorded their remarks from the same room in the Tribunal de Commerce, where the first meeting of the ICC court took place 100 years ago. And next slide. And I recorded my remarks from the United Nations General Assembly building in New York. And why was I there? I spoke from the UN because of the pioneering role that the ICC played in the adoption of the 1958 Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, known as the New York Convention. Most significantly, ICC prepared the first draft of that treaty. And once adopted, ICC used its global network to encourage countries around the world to ratify it. Now, the New York Convention has almost universal acceptance with more than 170 signatories, and it is the cornerstone of international arbitration. Under the convention, arbitral awards are presumed to be enforceable, and this is the key reason why international arbitration has become the preferred method for resolving cross-border disputes. There is no equivalent global treaty providing for the recognition of court judgments. So what did arbitral awards look like in the early days of the ICC court compared to what we see today? If you want a full analysis, I'll again refer you to Mikhail Shinazi's book and a presentation recently given by uh, Emmanuel Jolivet, who's ICC's general counsel uh, during Paris Arbitration Week. But so today I will just give you some highlights. First, language. In the early days, most of the awards were in French. Very few were in English, even less in German. Now we have arbitrations conducted in more than a dozen languages with English as the most popular and Spanish coming in at number two. Second, the types of disputes. The types of disputes in the early days of the ICC court 
reflect the type of international trade at that time. In other words, mostly sale of goods, silk, cotton, tobacco, or manufactured items. The cases focused primarily on conformity of goods. And it was common in those cases for the arbitrator to physically inspect the goods. For example, in one case from 1928, uh, that case involved mother of pearl. And the arbitrator wrote that he was presented with a sample of the mother of pearl that was supposedly delivered by the claimant. And then he looked at two full baskets of the goods. And it was clear to him in his own observations that what was delivered was not the same quality and appearance as the sample, so the defendant was right to reject the mother of pearl. Third, time lag. Now, when we talk about time lag, what we're referring to is the time between when a contract is executed and when an arbitration is filed. And because in the early days, most of the cases involved the sale of goods, the time lag between that execution of the contract and when the claim was filed was very short, typically only a few months. Now, about 40% of our cases involve construction and energy disputes, and the remainder span across a range of sectors, telecom, life sciences, technology, finance, transportation, among others. And the time lag between the contract and the filing of the case is much longer, reflecting the complexity of the underlying transaction. In fact, less than 20% of the cases arise from transactions within the previous two years. 37% arise from transactions three to five years ago, and the rest are even from transactions more than five years ago. Fourth, the parties. Not surprisingly, the nationality of parties in the early days of the ICC court involved mostly Western European parties. Now we have parties from almost 150 different countries with Asian Pacific parties comprising 25% of the parties. US is the top nationality using ICC arbitration followed by Brazil with Chinese and Indian parties coming in in the top 10. States and state-owned enterprises were parties in record in 25% of the cases. And more than 30% of our cases now involve parties from the same country, especially Brazil, United States, and Mexico, as well as many others. Fifth, the method of appointment for arbitrators in the early days was that the court mostly appointed the arbitrators. Now, the ICC court only appoints about 25% of the arbitrators. The other 75% are upon nomination by the parties or joint nomination by the co-arbitrators to select the president of the tribunal. Now, the nationality and the diversity of the arbitrators in the early days were mostly male and Western European. Now, arbitrators come from almost 100 different countries. 20% of the arbitrators are Latin American, almost 30% of the arbitrators are women, and more than 40% of the arbitrators are women of those who are appointed by the court. Now, with regard to the profile of the arbitrators, which is seventh in my list, in the very early days, most arbitrators were merchants, CEOs, businessmen, or leaders of professional organizations or chambers of commerce. There are meeting notes from those early days which describe lawyers as complicating things and often a nuance, a new nuisance rather, uh, that lawyers are complicating things and a nuisance to businessmen. The notes go on to state that lawyers should be brought in only at the very end of the process once all important things have been, been agreed upon by serious people meaning the businessmen. Now, of course, most arbitrators in ICC arbitration are lawyers or have legal training. Eight, outside counsel. In the early days, the parties participating direct, participated directly in the proceedings, often with senior executives handling the case rather than outside counsel. Now, 
almost all parties that are participating have outside counsel representing them in the case. Ninth, place of arbitration. The place of arbitration reflected the parties and the transactions at the time. Now we have ICC arbitration seated in more than 100 different cities in more than 60 countries around the world with about 5% of our cases seated in Singapore. Lastly, enforceability. In the early days, the ICC had a practice of naming and shaming parties that didn't comply with their arbitral awards. The 1922 rules, adopted even before the court was formed, provided that the ICC court had the right to request that the name of the defaulting party be published in the ICC's official publications and those of the national committees together with the text of the award that was not paid. In essence, as Shinazi explains, arbitration was a gentleman's game and commercial reputation could serve as an effective means of pressuring parties to comply with awards. Under the 1922 rules, the parties were, and I quote, in honor bound to carry out the award of the arbitrators. Now in the late 20s and 30s, formal sanctions aimed at achieving enforcement through legal structures began to take place, began to take shape in place of moral sanctions. The notion of honor was removed from the 1927 rules and replaced with language that said, that the parties shall be bound to comply with the award. Then the Geneva framework introduced new legal remedies for the enforcement of awards, and then that was all strengthened with the New York Convention. So if I were to sum up the early days of the court, I would say this, the characteristics of the early cases reflect international trade at the time. Now the ICC court has administered 27,000 cases. And during that time, we've seen so many changes and in innovation, including the adoption of mediation and expert rules, opening of the ADR center, the adoption of emergency arbitrator procedures and expedited procedures. And over the last 100 years, we have seen the rules and procedures adapt to reflect the changing nature of global business and the changing nature of disputes. I now wanna to talk to you about the scrutiny of ICC awards, how that process evolved and what are the types of issues that arise in the scrutiny process now? So to begin, what exactly do we mean when we talk about the scrutiny of ICC arbitral awards? This is a unique feature of ICC arbitration. Under Article 34 of the rules, arbitrators cannot draft their awards and send them directly to the parties. Instead, they need to send their draft awards to the ICC court for a process we call scrutiny. During the scrutiny process, we are reviewing the award to assure that the reasoning is clear and that all of the claims and all of the defenses have been properly considered. We are also considering to the extent practicable the requirements of mandatory law at the place of arbitration. And why are we doing this? It is not just to make the award look pretty. We are doing this to ensure that the award is as enforceable as possible. In other words, going back to our discussion on the New York Convention. We are ensuring that the parties are getting the benefit of arbitration and why they adopted and opted for arbitration, which is to have an enforceable award. During the scrutiny process, the court may lay down modifications as to the form of the award and without affecting the tribunal's liberty of decision. The court may draw the tribunal's attention to points of substance. Now it's interesting to note that the 1922 rules 
were silent on this matter. They provided that a copy of the arbitrator's decision should be sent to the ICC and that the parties would receive a certified copy of the decision once the fees were paid. But once the ICC court was created in 1923, we can see the concept of scrutiny emerge. As the explanatory notes from 1923 state, it is understood that before signing the award, arbitrators must submit the draft of their award to the court for examination from the point of view of form. No award can be pronounced without having been submitted for the approval of the court. And this concept was then incorporated into the 1927 rules. Now in the first decade of ICC arbitration, the court scrutiny was limited to the formal aspects and the court saw to it that the awards rendered were in the proper legal form. 1933 marks the start of the scrutiny process as we know it today in which the court was authorized to comment on the substance of the award as well as to form, and the rules were amended to provide as such. Now the scrutiny process involves multiple layers of review and it takes three to four weeks. As a first step, the secretary of the court reviews the draft award and prepares suggested comments, setting out observations on various drafting and substantive points. The court then reviews the award with the assistance of the secretariat's comments and identifies the points to be brought to the attention of the tribunal. The court also decides whether to approve the award as drafted, approve the award subject to its comments being subsequently addressed by the tribunal or not approve the award and invite the tribunal to provide a further revised draft. And just to give you a sense of the numbers, in 2021, out of the 630 awards that were uh, uh, issued, most awards were appro approved subject to comment. That means the court, via the secretariat, provided comments to the tribunal and left it to the secretariat to coordinate with the tribunal to finalize the award. But 69 awards that year, or about 11%, were not approved. That meant that the issues in the draft were so substantial that the court felt it was important to review another draft of the award. Now, this is important. Had the parties not selected ICC rules, those problematic awards would have been issued directly by the part to the parties. And the only avenue of recourse the parties would have had was to seek to have the award vacated at the seat of the award. In other words, the scrutiny process is that important protection to the parties. So what are some of the issues we see most frequently when scrutinizing draft awards? Let me highlight just five now. The first is legal authority. During the scrutiny process, if the court notices a legal authority cited that is not associated with a submission from the parties, it will usually inquire whether that legal authority or argument was raised by the parties, and if so, where in the record and how the opposing party responded. This submission can bring to light an issue of form or points of substantive concern. Second, fraud and red flags. Tackling allegations of fraud can be tricky and the scrutiny process can help ensure that the award appropriately addresses such issues. Arbitral tribunals should not jump to conclusions that implicate fraud, but they should pay appropriate attention to any red flags that give rise to legit legitimate questions of fraud that may require additional inquiry. The court may invite the tribunal to ensure that matters which could be red flags are properly addressed given that an award may be set aside for contravening public policy, failing to decide all issues, or if the tribunal goes too far, deciding something that the parties have not argued. Arbitral tribunals should be vigilant to deal with these sorts of issues if they arise in an appropriate level of detail in the award. Three, 
non-participating parties. When a case involves a non-participating party, the scrutiny process will focus in particular on the procedural history of the matter, decisions on jurisdiction, and the arbitral tribunal's reasoning on the merits. To demonstrate that due process was consistently respected and that the non-participating party was given a full opportunity to be heard, the court expects to see a detailed procedural history in the award of all pertinent steps. The court is therefore focused on whether the award contains references to the way notices were sent, whether the attempts were made and notices received, how records of the notices were kept, whether the non-participating party was informed, and such detailed documentation can show that all measures have been taken to inform the non-participating party of each step of the procedure. In cases involving a non-participating party, arbitral tribunals also need to decide on their own jurisdiction per Article 6.3 of the rules. The court, therefore, is considering whether the award addresses the existence of a binding arbitration agreement and contain reasoning on their decision. Arbitral tribunals are also expected to reflect in the award that they have even handedly considered the evidence and neither automatically accepted the participants' arguments nor advocated for the non-participating party's case. In short, the court is assessing whether the award shows how the tribunal independently tested all claims and reached their conclusions. Fourth, costs. Cost decisions are not always addressed thoroughly in draft awards. The court will consider whether the tribunal has clearly set out the party's positions on costs, specified the total amounts claimed, provided an assess assessment of the reasonableness of the party's costs, and included a decision on who should pay these costs in what specific proportion and why. And fifth, interest. Parties often neglect to address in sufficient detail issues pertaining to interest and instead make a conclusory request for interest or rely upon a general statement at the end of their submissions requesting from the tribunal any relief that the tribunal may deem appropriate. Arbitral tribunals also frequently give insufficient attention to requests for interest especially in cases in which the parties have not provided fulsome submissions on these issues. Issues regarding interest, which may need further attention, include whether the party seeks interest on all amounts awarded, including costs or only on certain amounts, the start and end dates for the calculation of interest, the applicable rate, whether interest should be simple or compound, and whether post-award interest should run on accumulated pre-award interest in addition to the principal claims at the same rate or at different rate. So the last point I wanna make about scrutiny is timing. We sometimes hear that the scrutiny delays the process, but I say that perception is outdated. We now have court sessions every week and are very aware of deadlines or other time sensitivities that need to be addressed. The scrutiny process now takes about a month at most, and it can be much shorter if the case is under the expedited procedures. And this is one of the key elements of the value proposition of ICC arbitration. Now we have talked about the past and reflected on current practice. But in this centenary year, we also must look to the future. And I know so many of you are focused on these issues and I really wanna hear your views as well. With the launch of our centenary, the ICC issued a declaration setting out guiding principles for the future of dispute prevention and resolution. So what are the priorities of the ICC court for the next century of dispute prevention and resolution. 
I will highlight just a few. And I will start with pledge seven, in which we pledge to amplify the benefit of the digitized economy and leverage technology to deliver efficient and pioneering dispute prevention and dispute resolution services. That's a mouthful. So let's break it down. In just the last few months, we have seen chat GPT pass the uniform uniform bar exam in the United States. In Singapore, a self-represented person used chat GPT to create a submission that included entirely fabricated case law. And in New York, just recently, a lawyer did the very same thing. He created a legal brief for a case in federal district court that was filled with fake judicial opinions and legal citations, all generated by ChatGPT. The lawyer said he did not comprehend that ChatGPT could fabricate cases, and the judge is now considering whether to impose sanctions on that lawyer. So for anyone in this audience who is not yet aware, various AI tools are prone to what are called hallucinations, which are entirely inaccurate or fabricated answers. But we have to remember what Richard Susskind has emphasized. The existing AI systems are the worst that they will ever be. We therefore need to understand how technology is developing and recognize the, the advancements in technology will be fast. And I mean, very fast. Now there is a lot of talk and fear about AI replacing lawyers and other white collar jobs that involve writing text and processing data. And I think that discussion is misplaced. Eric Benjafson, who is the director of the Stanford Digital Economy Lab has emphasized that AI is not going to replace lawyers. Instead, lawyers working with AI will be replacing lawyers who don't work with AI. So where do I see technology changing the future of dispute prevention and resolution? I agree with Chief Justice Menon. AI will both shape the expectations that people have for accessing dispute resolution services and create an opportunity to shape our own services to advance access to justice. At AICC, we are focused on both sides of the coin. We are already in the midst of transforming how parties and other stakeholders access our services with the launch of ICC Connect, which now enables streamlined communication and file sharing among parties, the arbitral tribunal and the case management teams. And VNext, will use centralized digital platforms for storage and provide end-to-end -end document management with increased flexibility. It's going to enable smart document creation to increase efficiency and enhance document templating options. And it will provide guidance with increasingly built-in technology, again, for greater ease of use and efficiency. And we are focused on how technology can enable us to offer a new suite of services to increase access to justice, especially for SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. But there are important questions that have to be addressed. And let me just raise three now. First, what trade-off between robust due process and faster less expensive, deci expensive decisions will parties accept? Will parties be willing to give up the opportunity to make one more submission or obtain additional documents to just get the matter resolved by a predictable date? I believe the answer to that question is yes, based on our experience with the expedited procedures introduced in 2017. We now have had more than 500 cases administered under the expedited procedures, and they have been a resounding success. Under those procedures, 
An award is issued within six months of the case management conference. The procedures apply for cases where the amount in dispute is less than 3 million US dollars. But what we have seen is parties opting into those procedures, even when the amount in dispute is more than 100 million US dollars, because they would rather have predictability and shorten timelines than the opportunity for additional submissions. Now, given that parties in higher value disputes select this faster and more predictable procedure, I do believe that even faster procedures for low value disputes will be accepted if we strike the right balance. Now, second, when justice delayed is justice denied, will global business and especially small and medium-sized enterprises accept a process provided by AI, blockchain, or other mechanisms rather than no process at all? In other words, are we ready for justice where humans are not involved in the decision-making? And even if we don't go that far, to what extent can AI tools be used as a component for decision-making and still have due process? Two important elements will have to be addressed. The first is bias, in which certain groups are often excluded from the data or where there is a lack of diversity in the data. What Dr. Joy Bualawini calls pale male data. We see this already in the problems with facial recognition software tools or other software or tools used to sift resumes. The insufficiency in the data undermines the fundamental reliability of any tools based on it. But this is not a new consideration. In some countries, there have been efforts to eliminate human biases with new tools such as sentencing guidelines, only then to consider the guidelines too harsh and want the pendulum to swing back to human considerations. Chief Justice Menon has recently commented that he expects that criminal justice is an area where human empathy is needed. So if we're going to rely on the data, we need to know it is reliable. Otherwise, no one will utilize those tools no matter how fast or how cheap. The second major concern is the opacity around what data is actually used and how it works algorithmically. If the data is in a black box and there is a lack of transparency around the data and the algorithms, the legitimacy of the system is undermined. Lastly, in arbitration, we have less stringent rules of evidence compared to national court systems. Documentary evidence is typically admitted unless specific objections are raised about their validity. But in a world where each of you can take your phone right this minute and put your own face into any photo, what can be believed? If photos and videos may no longer be trustworthy, what will be the new methods by which we confirm authenticity? In short, we know technology will transform how disputes will be resolved. Technology creates tremendous potential, but it also has tremendous risks. At the ICC court, we feel a very serious responsibility to wrestle with these issues and meet the rapidly evolving needs of global business. Now, the focus on how technology will shape the future of dispute resolution is related to pledge five of our declaration in which we pledge to improve transparency in the dispute resolution and prevention process, enabling democratization of information, consistency, and a greater understanding and trust in the process while respecting legitimate expectations of confidentiality. Under my predecessor, Alexi Moore, major steps were taken to increase 
the transparency of the process, including providing reasons for decisions on challenges, publishing names and nationalities of arbitrators, and publishing awards where the parties so agree. Last year, we broadened our scope of partnership with USMundi to enable wider access to ICC's digital resolution library, including various reports, guides, and model contracts. And now the entire library is searchable and interactive, and we provide the latest issue of the bulletin for free. These are important steps, but in the future, we must go even further. I call this Transparency 2.0, in which anyone can read our rules, anyone can read our materials, and anyone can understand our process. We have a project underway examining our model letters, our rules, our note to the parties and arbitrators, and expect this will transform how we communicate and how parties engage with our services. And while it's difficult to predict the future, there is one aspect of the future in which I have a high level of certainty. That is our dedication and benefit from diversity and inclusion set out in Pledge 8. The ICC was born in Paris and gained momentum originally in Europe, but we are now global and the global business community rightfully demands that their decision makers reflect that diversity. We have seen great strides in gender diversity in international arbitration, but our work is not yet done. And we are focused on diversity broadly defined. This week, we are launching the expansion of the LGBT plus network to anyone in the dispute prevention and dispute resolution community building on the launch of the network at the ICC court when I came into office two years ago. Diversity broadly defined is key to the legitimacy of international arbitration. It is essential that everyone knows they belong and the dispute prevention and resolution community reflects the global business community. In addition, in the coming months, Look for the guide on disability inclusion in international arbitration and ADR, just approved by the Commission on Arbitration and ADR. Now, with increased calls to track race and ethnic diversity, we are also focused on how to create a global system that is workable and legal. Challenges include the fact that categories in one country make no sense in another country, the sheer number of different race and ethnicities in various countries, that some ethnicities are officially recognized and others are not, and people often consider themselves in more than one category. What I have seen is tip on a global scale is typically so high level that it mirrors geography or nationality and does not address race and ethnic minorities in particular countries or regions. Yet I'm very conscious that if we don't measure something, it can be very hard to make progress. Self-identification may be the solution, but we welcome your ideas. So to close, I say this, if we take the pledges of our centenary declaration as guideposts to continually assess whether we are on track, we can achieve our renewed purpose to enable access to justice and the rule of law by providing in our innovative and trusted dispute prevention and resolution services. If we stay true to our principles, I believe we can fulfill the bold dream we memorialized at the end of the declaration, that future generations will reflect on our contemporary achievements with the same reverence that we have for our predecessors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claudia. That, that was an amazing uh, walk through both the history of the ICC as well as some wonderful 
um, really exciting plans coming up um, and, and an interesting peek uh, into the challenges that you are already um, aware of and are likely to have to grapple with regarding generative AI and, and other um, you know, newly evolving technology. Um, first of all, can I just congratulate you on ICC reaching 100 years? I mean, that's even older than the United Nations itself. Um, and and it's, it's such a, a wonderful thing that it was started on the basis of trying to promote peace through trade. I think that's, um, that's a story that isn't often told enough to people. Um, and, and very interesting stories about the location, why Paris and the meeting in Atlantic City and so on. Um, re really exciting stuff. Um, I, I just want to get into a few quick questions, if you don't mind, um, you know, in order of the, the, the topics that you um, basically shared. Um, first of all, um, thank you so much for, for opening the hood uh, and letting us have some sense of what actually goes into the scrutiny process of an award, which I think is, is sometimes misunderstood. I think people don't realize how much work is involved. Uh, I, I personally was quite intrigued about the whole bit about interest um, and uh, how do you calculate interest and the rate and, and when it begins and so on. That, that's a kind of detail that I think is amazing about what the, the court does. Um, but of course, you did allude to the fact that parties uh, on the other side say that, well, it slows down the award because you add an extra month at, you know, inside this process and we're already waiting for so long. Um, but, but you pointed out that the scrutiny of the award is precisely because you want to ensure that the awards are the best written versions of themselves so that you don't face any enforceability issues. Um, does the ICC have any visibility, any statistics on you know, how much more uh, ICC awards get enforced around the world compared to awards that come from non-institutional arbitrations? Uh, thank you so much uh, for your kind words and also for that very, very important question. Uh, what we see um, is that uh, parties anecdotally are less likely to challenge awards that are issued at the ICC because of the fact that they are buttoned up. We also see that uh, courts have an understanding and an appreciation of the review that is happening at the ICC. Now, of course, that does not guarantee that there are not some uh, circumstances in which awards do get overturned. Um, but uh, in general, from the um, information that is broadly generated, although we don't have concrete statistics on that, it's the anecdotal aspects that uh, we see they are, are regularly uh, enforced or less likely to be challenged. Well, that, that's, that's great to hear because I think people, um, you know, they want that kind of assurance that after all the work that has gone into an arbitration, you're right at the final hurdle enforcing it and then that's where it fails. So, so the idea that the ICC provides that extra layer of confidence uh, that your award in hand will lead to an outcome that you want, I, I think that's something that's really appreciated by parties. I remember a couple of years ago uh, in a court session we were having um, one of the draft awards was just absolutely terrible. Uh, in essence, this arbitrator who was selected by the parties, you know, had gone rogue and issued uh, his award, uh, arguing that the claimant had failed to submit sufficient evidence, notwithstanding the fact that the claimant had asked for the opportunity to submit additional evidence. I mean, just all the things that uh, shouldn't be happening. And this, the air in the room at the court session uh, when we were actually meeting in person, kind of uh, felt so heavy. And then we had this moment of realization when one court member goes, the process worked because had we not gone through the scrutiny process, this award would have been issued. And the claimant's only avenue of recourse would have been to go to the court. And uh, that is what we do. That's, that's wonderful. Um, related to this question, I'm not sure you can answer it and, and please feel free if you can't, but um, if you do see awards of that sort, I mean, it's quite clear that the court 
uh, works with the arbitrator to basically fix the award and, and to rectify you know, the kind of defects it has. But what does that also do to the court itself in terms of thinking about whether or not um, you know, we need to think carefully about this particular individual in future. Will we ever consider not appointing this person? I, I know this in this case that you mentioned, it was a party appointed uh, choice. But, but does that play on the mind of the court? Like, oh my goodness, is this the quality of judgment from this individual? And we may have to be careful in the future about whether this person should be allowed, you know? Uh, I can definitely answer that. And I can say, yes, it is in our minds. So if we're uh, the ICC making an appointment and somebody has done a terrible job, that absolutely factors into whether we would consider appointing that arbitrator in the future. It doesn't mean that the person is banned for life, um, but it's definitely um, a factor. Now, the interesting question comes in, if that arbitrator is nominated by a party, are we, the ICC court, ever not going to confirm that arbitrator because of past quality issues when there's no issues around independence and impartiality? That has not been our practice. That would mean that we were overriding the party choice for an arbitrator. Um, even though we have the right officially to do that. Um, but I think that would spark uh, far more controversy than be viewed as a protection at this stage. No, no, I mean, that, that sounds like a perfectly reasonable position, um, but, but maybe I would leave something as food for thought for, for the ICC. Um, it may be that the parties in that case are not necessarily appointing this individual from a position of, of an understanding of what the person's quality is like, at least in the current um, scenario, because there may be individuals um, who have had a stellar track record and reputation in the past, but of late may have begun to you know, see a dip in their standards that the ICC above all would be aware of. Parties themselves would not know this. So, um, whether the ICC in the future might have a, have a role to play in sort of reaching out to the parties in such a scenario to say, um, you know, we know that this is a party choice, but we just want to say that we've had in the past um, issues with this um, and, and, and not like small issues like minor defects, but a really terribly written award. Would the ICC feel that there's, there may be a, a role to play in sort of contacting the parties to say, uh, we just want to let you know. And if the parties say that, well, we still want to go ahead, that's their choice. No one's going to override them. But it may give them pause and say, actually, we weren't sure. We were kind of on the fence. But now the ICC has, has given us this bit of info. Um, we're quite happy to go back and discuss and maybe pick another person to a point. I, I don't know whether that's a role for ICC. Um, it's definitely something we hear periodically. Then we also hear the opposite and kind of the implications that would have for the arbitrator uh, and also uh, for the parties themselves. So it's in my mind something, there's a careful walk. Um, at this stage, it's not something that um, ICC is doing, but it's a very interesting conversation to be had as everybody is really focused on the quality of the arbitrators along with the balancing of party choice, which really is the first aspect for us. Lovely, lovely. Now, moving on to another question. Um, well, one very good thing about ICC is that you have a long history and you've been around for a while. But there are also challenges on that front because um, you also need to find a way to remain relevant in a, in a world that's changing. And I, I think the, the consensus for most people is that the world is changing faster than it used to change, um, which means that your reaction time for adapting your rules, your processes, your policies uh, is greatly shortened. I mean, if, if you asked anyone a year ago about AI and its use, um, at most, people will tell you, oh, yeah, it helps me, you know, find a, a driver on Uber or for Google, you know, for help, helping me search for, you know, things that I'm looking for. No one would have imagined that the word AI today is associated with, you know, computer generating music and art and videos and uh, even submissions for, you know, lawyers. So all of these things um, 
reflect how quickly these things have arrived and where we will go, no one knows. Um, so what is the ICC's um, you know, process for trying to adapt to these changes and ensuring that your rules and your policies uh, remain relevant in a world that is moving faster than any of us imagine? Really, the pandemic has highlighted an aspect that so much of the technology that we are now utilizing daily, like having this Maxwell lecture uh, via Zoom, actually existed pre-pandemic. And it was something that we were not utilizing or thinking about adapting into our daily work and lives. I would say that the same thing uh, is in the case of AI. So much of AI, not chat GBT, which is so accessible now to over hundred million people, but uh, that type of generative uh, technology has been utilized in many aspects of our lives already. Uh, I mentioned too in my talk in terms of facial recognition and also um, uh, reviewing resumes. I mean, one uh, company that uh, uh, in the United States, the CEO estimates that 80% of resumes now in the United States are reviewed first by an algorithm before they even get to a human. And so you are absolutely right. We have to be um, thinking about these issues uh, all the time. Uh, we have kind of various work streams focused on how we are uh, both changing the way uh, our stakeholders access our services and changing our services. Uh, just to highlight also, you know, there were um, 14 years between the 1998 rules and the 2012 rules. Then there was uh, five years until the 2017 rules, then four years until the 2021 rules. Now there's like also a careful balance between uh, having stability, but also making sure that we are re really responding to the changing needs of uh, the global business. And that's really top of mind for us. Thank you. There, there is another question um, that I had regarding this uh, specifically now on AI, since we are, we've moved to this part of the conversation. Um, so it appears from what you shared earlier that the scrutiny process that the court does um, is very clearly centered on how the award was written in terms of clarity, internal consistency, and even things like uh, some level of compliance with local laws and, and stuff like that. Um, but one of the challenges that we all see coming um, is when AI is used to create um, evidence that doesn't exist. It's not even a hallucination necessarily, but it's an actual attempt to defraud people using extremely uh, sophisticated tools, which you know, some people would describe it as, for example, deep fakes, uh, videos and sounds, or like you said, you know, uh, an image that you can't believe anymore because it's your face on some other background. Um, and it's not that it couldn't be done in the past. I mean, there were always the ability to, you know, Photoshop someone and so on. But it's just that the AI tools make it so easy to use, so powerful and, and so quick that you could be inundated with so much um, things that you can't tell what's true or not. Um, and so you may end up in a scenario where the award itself is not defective because of any of the law or the process, but vast amounts of evidence in there was not um, tested properly or was just no one can tell that it's, it's fake. Um, would the ICC ever see itself at some point playing a role of um, you know, providing some tools for the tribunal to be able to, you know, in, a, in a way, what I would describe as the AI wars, where you have AI on your side as a tool provided by the ICC because maybe individual arbitrators or tribunals may not be aware enough or have access to such tools, but the ICC may provide a tool that will allow the tribunal to at least get a sense of whether things that's being presented to them, that's being um, you know, argued in front of them, 
are actually all um, you know, AI generated and, and really are uh, not to be relied upon because they are either hallucinations or they are intentionally fraudulent. Um, I don't know, just a question whether you see any role for ICC in that in the future. You raise a really interesting question. Uh, the ICC rules currently do not address any issues regarding the submission of evidence. In fact, none of the arbitral institutions rules do. Uh, we have broad uh, statements in our rules that the um, actual uh, arbitration process, the actual uh, arbitration itself is uh, to be determined by the arbitrators. What we have seen around the world is broad acceptance and utilization of the IBA rules on the submission of evidence as a hybrid approach to civil law and common law. Those uh, IBA rules do not address questions of authenticity. The common practice is that parties just submit evidence. Those, uh, and, and they're typically in, unless somebody is specifically raising a question about the authenticity. So in other words, it's on the um, other parties uh, burden to raise questions as opposed to what is frequently in court, that it is the burden of the submitting party to demonstrate authenticity before it can even come in. So the court serves as a gatekeeper in that context. Um, so there are some very serious questions that need to be raised about whether kind of for the legitimacy of the process now, whether there's going to need to be more robust uh, systems for authenticating documents uh, and where that is going to come from. Is that going to be um, something more general that could be utilized in any uh, arbitration or dispute resolution process around the world? Or is that gonna be something that gets um, provided by the um, particular institution or by ICC and that we need to grapple with. Thank you. There's another question here. Um, I'm just gonna read it verbatim. Uh, it is so good to hear your emphasis on the dispute prevention as opposed to dispute resolution um, in the next phase of ICC's goals. Could you share what specific program goals or targets the ICC wish to see in this next phase of dispute prevention? Yes, uh, we are going to see um, the launch of the ICC's reports from our task force on arbitration and ADR that was co-chaired by Qian Bao, who's based in Singapore and I um, have seen is attending this lecture. So on July 3rd, uh, we will have the launch of those reports. There's actually two uh, reports that will be launched. One is how arbitrators can facilitate settlement. And the second is guidance for parties and counsel to consider all of the tools in the toolbox, not just before an arbitration has been filed, which has been the typical approach, kind of in that stair step approach um, uh, where there's negotiation then potentially mediation, and then if all those efforts fail, arbitration. But what we're really focused on with these reports um, and more generally in um, all of the training and education and engagement we're doing is making sure that the parties have the tools and the way in which they can utilize um, alternative and amicable dispute resolution options, even once the arbitration has been filed to potentially resolve their dispute before the award is issued. Wonderful. Um, here's another question. Um, what are some technologies that you wish to see developed or used in the future that may possibly help us in our efforts to move towards greener and more sustainable arbitral practices? 
what I believe is going to be necessary is technology that enables us to have more hybrid engagement. Uh, it's actually the conversation you and I were just having uh, before the start of this uh, lecture, which is we seem to be good right now at purely virtual communication and good at purely in-person communication. But when uh, we have hybrid engagement, a lot of times it's lost for both the people in the room and the people on the screen. Uh, what is required currently is almost the equivalent of, you know, TV or movie production with multiple cameras um, in order to assure that uh, those who are on the screen can see all the faces of the multiple people who might be speaking and the sound quality is good. So I believe that there's going to be a demand for hearing centers, uh, including uh, for Maxwell Chambers, that uh, the hybrid engagement really works uh, more seamlessly uh, because in-house counsel will also want to engage more on a hybrid uh, basis uh, for hearings. Uh, they may not want to travel uh, to attend the entire hearing, but different people within the companies may want to attend one or two days and they need to then be able to engage with their teams, with their lawyers, and not just have an obser observation status. I'm sorry, um, I was muted. Um, there's another question. Um, I don't know, again, if you can answer this, but I'll just read it in any case. Uh, how does the ICC deal with dissenting opinions in the scrutiny process? A very important question. Uh, the ICC court does not scrutinize dissenting uh, opinions. What we do, however, is give heightened review to those arbitration awards where there is a dissent. So most arbitral awards are reviewed by a three person committee, but we have what we call a special committee and the special committee, which typically has 20 to 40 people reviews cases involving states or state-owned enterprises and also cases involving dissents. And that could be even when there's not um, a written dissent, but even where one arbitrator has put in a footnote, I dissent from paragraph 62, that will go to the special committee. In the special committee, it's not only um, a heightened scrutiny because it's reviewed by a larger number of people, but for each case in the special committee, one member of the court prepares a report in writing like three to five pages and also gives an oral report. So in addition to the um, comments from the secretariat for the court members to review, there's also the additional report from the court member. What we're really looking at with the award is to make sure that the award has addressed the issues that are raised in the dissent, not point by point, but as appropriate um, to the extent that uh, could create any further issues for enforcement. Well, Claudia, thank you so much. I mean, this, this um, you know, insight into the process of ICC has been invaluable. In fact, I, I wonder whether uh, council and, and parties uh, actually understand the rigor that the ICC puts into each award when it scrutinizes it. And I think if they, they really understood your processes, um, there'll be no question that they would really say this is what we should be doing for our cases. Um, but, but we've now actually reached the end of the time that we have. Um, thank you so much again um, for the parties who uh, had questions that we didn't have time for. We will compile it and we will send it over to Claudia. But, but may I just say thank you once again for your time. 
uh, and, and for just um, giving us such a wonderful uh, look at, at why ICC is the premier institution around the world for arbitration. Thank you very, very much. I really am so honored to get to give the Maxwell Lecture and so appreciate everyone joining us today. Thank you very much.